Hello, and welcome to Traditional Chinese Medicine. My name is Christina Kapothanasis. I'm a licensed acupuncturist here in the state of Hawaii and am board certified under the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. I am also the executive director of the Hawaii Oriental Medicine and Acupuncture Association. Today, I would like to continue my um, sharing of the vegetables in part one we discussed what I like to call watery vegetables, which are usually very hydrating to the body. And today, we're going to move along and talk about the in-between vegetables. For lack of a better word, we can call them the neutral vegetables. The watery vegetables are, as I mentioned, more usually cooling and hydrating. And on the other end of the spectrum are leafy vegetables, which in general are a little bit bitter and more dehydrating. And other vegetables I put in the middle category of neutral vegetables. So in no particular order, we will start with um, the vegetables of green beans. Green beans, we just finished Thanksgiving, and I bet everybody had some lovely green beans. Though we need to prepare them slightly differently with uh, Chinese medicine and the Christina diet. The Thank you. The um, thermal properties and organs that are associated with each foods, as we do with the herbs and the foods, um, are ranging between cold to hot. So cold, cool, neutral, warm, and hot. And then they can have different flavors of salty, spicy, sweet, no flavor, which is called dan, and we can have different organs that they enter or that they have more of an effect on, like heart, liver, lung, spleen, kidney, etc. So for the green beans, the thermal nature is warm and the flavor is sweet. Maybe not sweet like ice cream, but sweet compared to a bitter melon. And it enters into the spleen, stomach, and kidneys. So it's just going to have more of an effect on that. The thermal property, as I've mentioned before, is not the hot or cold to the touch of the food. It's the effect it has on the body. Just like a hot chili pepper may make you feel flush and sweat, whereas um, a cool mint tea may make you feel refreshed and cooler. This is what I'm talking about when I say the thermal property. So green beans will warm the middle and they'll help the chi go down or the energy in the body go down. That would mean that it's good for helping people go to the bathroom as long as they're not too hot. And it's good for building the kidneys and building the kidney chi. So sometimes people with kidney deficiency will experience lower back pain or frequent urination or soreness in the legs. So this would be one vegetable that you could eat to amend that. You just have to be careful that you don't have too hot of a constitution. When we say constitution, that just means your body type. Everybody's um, constitution is different on the scale of hot to cold. Some people always bring a sweater with them wherever they go and they're really easily chilled and they love warm soups. This person would have a cold constitution or another person may have uh, always a red face and quite a fiery temper, and they love to eat spicy things, probably not good for them, and that would be a hot constitution. So people that have warmer constitutions or even dry constitutions, the green bean would be warm. So if you feel things like thirst, or you're a little bit constipated, or the stools are hard, or you have a heat in your stomach that causes you to believe you're always hungry, these are some of the hot signs. So when we talk today about heat and cold and which um, vegetables would be good or not good for those constitutions, that's what we mean. There are several ways to prepare green beans. When I was looking for our Thanksgiving dinner, I saw all of them in cream of mushroom. And everybody knows that I am strongly against dairy products. So we prepared our green beans by blanching them and stir frying them in hot oil that had ginger in it. And then we made lotus chips as our um, replacement for the French onions. 
We sliced the lotus chips very thin and blanched them for a couple minutes, patted them dry, squeezed lemon and oil and salt on them and baked them in a warm oven for 10 minutes. So this could be one alternative to the traditional green bean recipe. The next picture we have for you today is bitter melon. This vegetable, you can tell it has tiny little bumps all over it and it's quite firm. It's usually only in Asian markets, but um, I didn't see it until I went to China. I definitely never saw it in the Midwest. So if you don't have bitter melon near you, that's okay. Bitter melon is bitter, obviously, and it's very cold on the scale of thermal qualities, how it affects the body. It goes into the heart and the spleen and the lungs. Going into the spleen, this vegetable is very good for diabetics that are not too dry. In Chinese medicine, even if you have a label of an illness, diabetes or pre-diabetes, or even if you have a common cold or whatever it may be, we have to separate that into our syndrome differentiation, which we've talked about in other videos, which you can feel free to go listen to. So for diabetes, if you're not too yin deficient, the bitter melon would be excellent for helping to control the sugar because it is so bitter and cold and it flushes out the heat, which is often associated with diabetes. It's good for brightening the eyes and it's good for clearing the heart fire. Heart fire can manifest in different symptoms from not being able to sleep well, any type of insomnia, having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up early, or excessive dreaming. Insomnia is usually due to heat in the body and or some kind of dampness in the stomach and the bitter melon, that bitterness will dry up any dampness you have in your stomach. It's also helpful for people with redness in the eyes or pain in the eyes and because it dries dampness, it can help people suffering from diarrhea. It will help take out the dampness and form the stools. The detoxifying properties of bitter melon make it very good for any kind of infections and or skin conditions if they're not too dry. Again, if they have more of a thick tongue coating, then that will be excellent for taking out the dampness, which is associated with skin conditions from um, eczema to psoriasis and other boils and cankers. Um, the only thing we have to watch out for with bitter melon is that you do not have a weak stomach or a cold stomach. Just like we mentioned that the green bean was warm and we don't want to give it to somebody who has an extremely hot stomach, bitter melon is one of the coldest vegetables there is. So if this person has a weak stomach and we put something highly bitter and cold in there, it might make their stomach uncomfortable or um, extinguish their digestive chi and make their digestion poor. Bitter melon is so hard to cook and hard to take for people who don't need the bitter. For people who need the bitter, it should taste wonderful to them. When people say, listen to your body, listen to your taste buds, it's usually because your body knows what it needs. And for a person with damp heat and a thick yellow tongue coating, bitter melon will taste wonderful. They can probably just slice it up raw and put it on a salad. But for a cold person or a person who's really dry and yin deficient, bitter melon will not taste as lovely. Or somebody whose taste buds have been um, hampered by lots of heavy foods and sweets, then it might not be palatable. So in that case, I recommend that you boil it a long time and don't try to eat it raw. In Taiwan, I've had it raw and I've had it stir fried. With different meats, they use the oil to try to soften the blow of the bitterness, um, but you can just see if you need it or not. Eggplant is our next picture, and I brought a picture of the small round eggplants because I think that they are tastier and a little bit hardier than the long um, purple eggplants that you may be more familiar with. Though the eggplants here that are purple also come in two sizes. So the aubergine, which is 
um, quite round, maybe three or four inches in diameter. Thank you. Uh, three or four inches in diameter, maybe this long is one type, and then the Japanese eggplant are smaller in diameter, maybe a couple inches long and skinny. So any of the eggplants will fall under the same category for our purposes today. I just like the little round white eggplants because they're a little hardier, as I said. Eggplant is cool in its thermal property and it's sweet. It works on the spleen, the stomach, and the large intestine. We just have to be careful about the eggplant because it's not only cooling to the digestive system, but it is cooling to the blood and it is circulating to the blood. That means that women who are pregnant should not ingest too much eggplant because if we circulate the blood, then we are promoting bleeding. That goes for women who have heavy periods or periods that are short. Their cycles are close together, more than 28 days. I'm, excuse me, less than 28 days. S or who have ovulation bleeding in between their periods. They spot or bleed every two weeks. Um, but for the rest of us, the eggplant will be an excellent food. And it also, because of that cooling blood property, is wonderful for skin conditions. I know that eggplant is part of the nightshade family with white potato and tomato, but when I take pulse and tongue and ask symptoms, uh, all my patients know that I'm very detail-oriented in checking on pulse tongue symptoms and correlating that to what foods are affecting their body. And as I see tomatoes affect the body in tongue impulse and symptoms and white potatoes, I don't see as many people with eggplants. So I don't shy away from eggplant as much as I do the tomato and the white potato. Of course, some people who are particularly allergic to nightshades, we would want to avoid, and it usually shows up as pain in the joints. So if eggplant causes pain in the joints, by all means, uh, stay away from it. But if it's okay, then you can use it for things like um, blood in the stools and or hemorrhoids and skin conditions. Since this is such a cold food, not cold and bitter like the bitter melon, but it's definitely cooling to the blood, it usually works better if you put warm spices with it. In China, they would always put garlic and onions and ginger and um, little spicy chili peppers. And when I played around with cooking it here, I understand why they do that. So I usually try to at least put ginger in there. And one dish that I feel gives it a lot of flavor is making it stir fried with a little bit extra oil because the oil is warm. Ginger and sweet bell peppers, any color you prefer. We usually use red, orange, and yellow. And that warmth in the sweet bell pepper will usually warm it up, warm it up enough to make it taste good. And one other note about the eggplant is that for its digestibility, it's better if you salt it and wait 30 minutes to an hour before you cook it. This will take out some of the water of the eggplant too and make it a little bit less bitter tasting and um, a little bit meatier. In, yes, so we just try to take it out of the eggplant parmesan with all the tomato and the cheese and come up with the different recipes to make eggplant. The next vegetable is water bamboo. And oh, I'm sorry, this was a picture of okra. And I'm sorry I didn't bring the picture of the water bamboo for you today, but we'll come back to okra in a minute. Uh, the water bamboo is long and white. It's not quite in season right now. And you peel off dark, uh, darker green leaves to expose a smooth, white, very sweet inner of bamboo. Uh, the water bamboo is sweet and it's cold. It works on the liver, the spleen, and the lungs. It's good for detoxifying and it's good for resolving thirst in the body because of its coolness. It can help moisturize and it promotes proper urination and bowel movements because of the cooling, moisturizing nature of this vegetable. 
Uh, it can help to treat conditions like urinary tract infections or diarrhea. It's also good for helping, not completely treating, different levels of jaundice and or red eyes. And it's good for women who are lactating and having trouble with their breastfeeding. The only thing we have to worry about with this is people with very weak digestive systems and chronic diarrhea. But other than that, just stir frying it, plain with a very mild flavored oil and salt, it's super sweet and delicious. One other kind of bamboo that I also did not bring a picture of you, a picture for you today, is the zhu sun. It has a larger base and it comes up in a cone. Um, this one is also delicious and sweet. It has uh, similar, similar properties for the sweetness and the cold, but it goes into the stomach and the large intestine. So it's going to have more of a strong elimination effect on the body, and it's going to help remove bloating and also transform any phlegm. When we have phlegm in the digestive system, which is something like inflammation in the digestive system, that usually will translate into helping clear up lung issues as well. So any food that has action on the large intestine will help those of you suffering from phlegm that is accumulating in the lungs. The next two, I'm sorry, I don't have pictures of, but it's two types of mushroom, which are commonly used in Chinese cooking and for our Chinese nutrition purposes. One is the shiitake mushroom, which is quite different from the regular button mushroom that I'm used to growing up with in the Midwest. It's a little bit larger in diameter than the button mushroom, and it's not quite as large as the portobello, but it is dark brown, just like the portobello mushroom. So the shiitake mushroom is sweet, and it has neither a warm nor a cool effect on the body. It has neutral effect on the body. It goes into the liver and the stomach. Shiitake mushroom is seen as a very powerful food in Chinese medicine. It's good for building up the qi and building the center qi, fu zhen. It's great for building the appetite, uh, helping people who have no appetite to reestablish appetite, and strengthening the spleen, which together in Chinese medicine with the stomach is the root of the digestive system. So it strengthens the digestive system as a whole. It's good for getting rid of wind and in Chinese medicine, wind can cause several different conditions, uh, from different skin rashes to twitches or spasms and different kinds of paralysis. And then it's good for moving the qi. And if we move the qi, it's something like turning on the fan and helping to dry out the dampness in the digestive system. And then it's good for detoxifying, and they see it as an anti-cancer medicine as well as food. So it's good for people who are very weak and frail and always fatigued. It's good for people who have poor weak digestive systems and or poor appetite. It helps build the blood and it's good for people with high blood pressure and um, high cholesterol. It's good for people with chronic liver, um, different kinds of liver diseases. It's good for people who have night sweats. That can go for male or female. Anybody who is extremely indeficient and hot will have night sweats. And it's good for different kinds of swelling. So the only time we do not want to give the mushroom is for people who have a lot of cold buildup of dampness in the stomach. So shiitake mushroom is seen as quite a powerful medicinal food. and the wood ear mushroom, or the wood ear fungus, doesn't quite look like a mushroom. It looks like a frilly, lacy fungus that grows on the side of trees in these big flower forms. It comes in the white color, and it comes in the black color, and it usually comes dried, and you buy it in big fluffy packages like this. You soak it first before you even start to cook it to rehydrate or reconstitute it. Uh, the wood ear mushroom is also neutral in thermal nature, and it is sweet. It goes into the lungs, the spleen, the large intestine, and the liver. 
It's excellent for boosting the blood and the qi. What I usually recommend it for is for nourishing the yin. And so people that are dry in their lungs and or in their large intestine, I give a soup with this, a recipe for a soup for all of my poor pregnant women who are suffering from some of the side effects from being pregnant, like constipation and trouble sleeping, um, because it's so excellent for nourishing the yin. So it moisturizes the lungs, it's good for people with dry cough, and it's good for stopping bleeding, and it's also like the shiitake, good for lowering people's blood pressure. So we can give it to people who are qi deficient, or blood deficient, or yin deficient. Yin is something like the moisture in your body that cannot be replenished by drinking more water alone. Since it's good for stopping bleeding and moisturizing the lungs, it's good for people who have um, blood in their phlegm, whether that just be sleek streaks or they're coughing up chunks of blood, nose bleeds, bleeding from hemorrhoids, and women who are having heavy menstrual cycles. Because it helps to lower the blood pressure, it's also good for people who have bleeding in the eyes, behind the eyes. And again, we just want to make sure that we don't give it to people with too cold of a digestive system. The wood ear mushroom recipe that I like to give to people is one that I learned while living in Asia. They make it into a sweet dessert. Though I've also had the black wood ear mush mushroom stir fried with vegetables and that tastes delicious as well. But the white wood ear mushroom soup has white wood ear mushroom and the lotus seeds. It has almonds and pear. They usually add sugar to that, but hopefully we don't have to add too much sugar or maybe a little agave syrup instead. And boiling that for about 20 minutes altogether, leaving the skin on the pear will help to moisturize the lung and stop the cough. Um, the Almonds will also help to moisturize the lungs and stop cough and will also help people to go to the bathroom for those suffering from constipation. So you can use this in a nice salty stir fry with um, different kinds of vegetables, green vegetables or eggplant, and you can also use it in a sweet, nice dessert. The picture we had brought up earlier of okra, if we could have that one more time, I know most people know what okra is, but this is a picture for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. These are a little bit on the large side. If you could pick smaller ones, they will be more tender. And they have little hairy um, particles on the outside and then a head and inside there's white, somewhat slimy little balls. Okra is dan, which means um, that it has a di diuretic effect on the body. It's one of the tastes that is no taste. <laughs> and it's also cold. It goes into the kidney and the bladder. So it can help to uh, work on a sore throat. Because of the little bit sliminess of the inside, it's excellent for people who are stuff suffering from different kinds of stomach conditions, um, different kind of inflammatory stomach conditions. So for people with um, gastritis or the beginnings of peptic ulcers, the sticky c will coat the inside of the stomach and will be cool and it will help you to heal. It's good for those women who are trying to increase their breast milk and it's also good for women who are trying to regulate their cycle. So we'll use it for people who have sore throats. We can all use, also use it for people who are having trouble with urination, with um, smooth urination flow, and also for the people with stomach conditions. For people who have ultra super stomachs and loose stools, we will try to not give them too much of this. Most people shy away from okra because if they can't uh, cook it like they do in the South, which is how I was used to growing up, cutting it, breading it in batter, and frying it, then they won't eat it because the way that I've had it prepared at Japanese restaurants is you pick it up and a long, streaky, sticky string trails behind it. So my husband, smart man that he is, 
figured out that if we parboil it for just five minutes, you have a big pot of boiling water, you throw them in, maybe not even five minutes, just until they turn bright green and then quickly take them out and put them under cold water. They become finger foods that are still very crunchy and you can avoid the slime factor but still get all the excellent benefits from them. <laughs> so that hopefully will entice you to retry okra if you have shied away from it. This is the first half of the neutral vegetables that I have prepared to share with you. And in our next series, in our next show, I can help to explore a little bit more of the neutral vegetables and give you a bigger selection. I know that most people um, usually stick to their one or two trusty vegetables, but the vegetables have different qualities and different actions on the body. It's very important to rotate our foods as much as we possibly can so that one effect doesn't build up on the body. Just as if we eat lots of garlic and onions and ginger every day, we will accumulate heat in the body. If we eat lots of the extremely cold and bitter melon every single day, then we will slowly get drier, which is why I usually encourage people to rotate their vegetables as much as they can. And as everyone knows, I really try to eat four to six cups of vegetables and encourage everybody to do the same because vegetables are the only alkalizing food. They are the most alkalizing foods compared to the grains, the beans, legumes, nuts, seeds, and definitely the animal products and dairy products out there. So I hope that you've enjoyed our show today. And if you have any questions about the vegetables or their effects on the body, please give us a call or email us. And until next time, mahalo!